Okay, so I'm the last uh, speaker on this panel, and I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, sort of taking these ideas uh, about ecosystem services and talk about how markets are a way that we can actually achieve outcomes that we're interested in. And I, I call myself an optimistic skeptic. Everything I'm going to tell you today is why I think these markets are problematic. But I'm going to end on the hopeful note, <laughs> which is that I, I also think uh, they're necessary, and I think there's a lot that we can do to make them work. And, and uh, so I hope to end up by addressing some of the concerns that Jillian mentioned. So why are we here talking about markets? Um, we can look around us and we see lots of opportunities. There is wetland banking. In Alberta, there's going to be wetland banking. Um, there already are payments for wetlands, biodiversity offsets, transfer development credits, there have been pilot projects, pseudo pilot projects, lots of stuff going on. Um, but the reason that we're trying to figure this out, these are all like administrative policy made up things, but we need to create some sort of incentive for people to recognize things that we do not currently pay for. And in fact, it's really hard to pay for them. So we call them designer markets, but because they're designer markets, they're complicated. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, this is the problem we're trying to solve. So on the one hand, we've got, I'm going to call them land managers, but you know, it could be industry, it could be farmers, uh, and they're going to take some management action uh, they might manage soil for organic matter, uh, convert crop plant to native vegetation, do different kinds of forestry, all sorts of things you can do. And then this creates a whole host of ecosystem services and benefits. So we've got carbon storage, we've got water storage, changes in water quality that leads to health benefits, reduced risk from flooding and all of that. Well, who's going to pay for all that? So on the very right hand side, what I have here are the people that are already paying for these things. We've got insurance companies. They're pretty worried about the flooding that's been going on. Uh, they're involved in trying to quantify these ecosystem services, and they're involved in getting people to change their practices. Uh, the, the government pays for ecosystem services. We have farm stewardship programs. We've had them for decades. We've been paying for ecosystem services for 50 years. But you wouldn't know it because the rate of change is uh, very rapid relative to what we're putting back. Retailers, so on the uh, supply chain side, we've got Walmarts, we've got Unilevers, we've got all sorts of purchasers of products from agriculture and forestry, and even in the energy sector. And now they want to demonstrate that the sourcing of everything right from the land up is sustainable. And there's going to be soon coming purchasing agreements with producers, etc., that are going to pay them for changes in practice. Municipalities, uh, I could go on and on, but this is to say that there's a wide variety of people that demand these things, and the problem with developing a market is getting that money into the hands of the land managers and making sure that they do the right management actions so that it makes a difference. So in addition to uh, all of these sort of voluntary, I'm going to call them private market transactions, we've got a whole host of regulations and policies which also push money into investments for ecosystems. Uh, so we've got uh, the Land Stewardship Act, it enables offsets. We've got the Public Lands Act. We've got wetland mit mitigation banking under the wetland policy. We have the land use framework. Uh, there's going to be all sorts of environmental management frameworks around water quality, biodiversity. And under each of those, we're going to have to figure out some way to achieve these objectives. And right now, the main producers of ecosystem services are people that own land, and it's private lands, and so we have to get some way for them to change their practices and money into their pockets for, for doing that. I already mentioned the uh, consumer demands and social license. Uh, these are emerging trends. Uh, risk management's huge. So here's where the issues arise. First of all, and, and I think this is a good thing. So there's a lot of this kind of ad hoc stuff happening. But it's not happening at any sort of scale that you would expect to see outcomes. And there's a huge hesitancy on the part of industry to engage in these markets. And the reason is, is that there's incredible me measurement challenges. Um, 
So we don't actually know how the changes in management practices lead to these different services. We have some ideas, we can go to theory, but for specific places in a specific watershed where there's a specific flood management issue, we often are not able to quantify those relationships. We don't actually know what we're paying for, and we don't know if the suite of things we're paying for is the best one. Now, if you look at Chesapeake Bay, where they have a water quality trading program, they have a list of BMPs that they expect farmers to use to reduce phosphorus. And they happen to be the least effective and the most expensive ones that, uh, that they found. So we, we, had, we need to be careful when we do this. And we have another concern. So uh, how do you aggregate these things? If you look at the wetland policy, we're going to rank the compensation requirements for taking out a wetland based on its ecological function, which more or less just means its uh, biodiversity and, and things like that. Then there's water quality benefits, its recreation and human use aspects. Do we just add them all up? Do we take an average? Do we make a developer replace each of those single functions? If it happens to be near Calgary, do we weight flood protection more? And there is no systematic set of principles that tells us how to aggregate these in an index. We love to use an index because if I'm going to go buy ecosystem services, I just have to go purchase something that gives me essentially a dollar figure. It's just telling me an amount. That's what an index does. But the index doesn't tell us how we added up all these different values and whether that's actually ethically or ecologically appropriate. Um, and then there's an issue of if a landowner already did something for carbon, do we pay that landowner more for water quality even though we're already getting the water quality from that carbon? So there's all sorts of issues. Ecological uncertainty. So with uh, banking restoration actions, we actually have a lot of uncertainty and it doesn't matter if we're looking at wetland banking or biodiversity banking. Uh, all of the evidence suggests that we are not replacing the values that we're losing. And uh, I'll come back to that later, but the most important reason is that there's huge time lags between the restoration action and then, you know, some benefits, yeah, you can walk around the, the retention pond or whatever it is. You're going to get the recreation and cultural values, but you're not getting your biological values back. Uh, the landscape context, so Jillian already talked about this, but how do we know what this little itty bitty wetland over here provides in terms of flood protection? But it matters if we take out all of the wetlands. And something else we do, we protect class three to five wetlands, but you know, or sorry, maybe the other way around, that little ephemeral guys, we can let them go. But what happens over time is when we start losing all those little wetlands, we start finding out that our Ramsar sites aren't performing very well because it's a system and it's a complex and you can't just pick and choose which pieces you want to protect out of it, which leads to another issue. If we only care about flood protection and we're going to move to this anthropocentric uh, concept of ecosystem services and we're going to start worrying about replacing the benefits to human, are we going to systematically self-select certain types of ecological functions? And if things are really connected and we don't understand that, will we start to systematically destroy our ecosystem? People get really worked up about additionality. So making sure in the carbon market, if you want to participate in the Kyoto market, you better make sure that you have all your I's dotted and T's crossed so that your carbon reductions are additional. But there's no participation in that market because the conditions are really, really stringent. Um, we know that uh, when we're looking at changes in practice uh, for agriculture that um, we want to focus on additionality because we don't want to pay people for things they're already doing. That's considered wasteful. Um, but what happens when we focus on additionality is we start to pay for only things that we can see. Because <laughs> we didn't know, were they going to drain that wetland? I don't know, it's already there, could disappear. Um, so we're going to pay for wetland restoration, 
but we're going to ignore the benefits of securement. Or we're, you know, it's a really low priority. So if you secure, wow, well, you're going to have to like pay 10 to one compared to restoring a wetland. That is what's in your wetland policy right now. And what does that do? It creates a perverse incentive against securement. For what reason? We already just saw that no restored wetlands perform the same benefits as secured wetlands. So why do we want to embed this in our policy? It makes no sense to me. Why? Because we have this idea about additionality. And it's just an idea. It came out of the US wetland compensation policy. We don't have to stick with it. Uh, Market participation, so landowner participation in these markets is really low. If we want to provide benefits for habitat at scale, we're going to have to move away from these ideas of Ducks Unlimited going and protecting wetlands here and there, or we're going to run a pilot project. Um, little, little itty bitty things. You saw all of those different buyers of ecosystem services, and all of the policy drivers, and all of the risks that we heard about Geneva talking about. There are millions, hundreds of millions of dollars that could be spent on ecosystem protection right now, today, if we get, could get people to agree on what to protect. But then we need the landowners to actually make the changes. And so they don't want to make the changes. We're asking them often, we want you to put an easement on your land. We want you to sell us part of your land. Uh, we want the change to be permanent, et cetera. But we know they're willing to enter into maybe long-term contracts. Some will do short-term contracts. Can't we find some way to add these all up into the changes that we want every year? If we end up going with this permanent route and having only easements and long-term uh, you know, purchases of land and things like that, what we end up with is either working landscapes with no protection or else we end up with protected areas. And one of the biggest policy barriers to these markets is the perception that these markets are just a de facto way of creating more parks without a social discussion around it. Uh, there's also an issue of duty of care. So people say, well, um, why should we pay bad actors? And what about the people who adopted early? Why, why shouldn't we reward them? And it's sort of an efficiency versus equity thing, okay? So again, we talked about additionality. We're not going to reward the early adopters. Um, but we, and we want to get all those bad guys into the market because they're actually the ones that are going to provide the biggest bang for the buck. Um, in the U.S. and a lot of water quality trading programs, what they've done is said, oh, you can only participate in this market if you've achieved, if you've already done all of these things. Well, from a cost perspective, that's ridiculous because we're asking them to do the last little thing they could do on their piece of land to reduce, you know, one kilogram of phosphorus when the guy next door to them on the road, you know, they're dumping phosphorus in, but they're bad actors and they could reduce for a much lower cost. Um, are there some other ways that we can reward early adopters? Can we recognize their leadership in some way? Can we take the surplus created by this market and give it back to the early adopters. So yeah, we're gonna pay the worst, uh, worst actors um, what they need, but then we could take some of the benefits and return them to these early adopters. So there's lots of options. I don't know why we kind of get stuck in one way of thinking about doing things. So the last thing I wanna talk about then is, uh, you know, ideas that we've been working on to get out of uh, some of these conundrums. The idea of a conservation exchange. So the, its purpose is really to coordinate investment. So leveraging all these different buyers uh, across all of these different uh, purposes and then into the highest value opportunities. Um, using common platforms and metrics. So. The, Really, if we want to protect biodiversity or species at risk, I don't see why the Nature Conservancy and Alberta Conservation Association don't use the same maps and metrics. If they did, then we could leverage all those investments. Sometimes a farmer is willing to set aside a field, but you know, we, they don't have enough buyers. Can we do multilateral contracts? You know, a whole bunch of oil and gas companies get together and purchase a quarter section or an easement on it for a bunch of little tiny fragmentations that they do in endangered species habitat. So uh, this is my last slide, but uh, I have a lot of colleagues and uh, they love talking to me about markets, but then they'll just say, oh, you know, but it's just one tool in the toolbox. And I really hate that, and I'll tell you why. 
And it's because most ecosystem services are produced on private and leased lands. And regulatory approaches, we've tried them, but they have a hard time focusing on outcomes. We end up focusing on the outputs. We've ignored cumulative effects. They're inefficient. Lots and lots of impacts that we need to worry about can't be regulated. They're too small. I mean, it would cost us so much to bring them under the regulatory umbrella. Markets help us do that. And if we don't have these markets and ways to bring everyone under incentives that get the non-regulated actors under the regulatory umbrella, then our landscape will continue to change and we will never keep up with the rate of change. We will never invest at scale. And so this is not just one tool in the toolbox. This is essential for managing land use change on working landscapes. We have to have markets and we have to have incentives for landowners to consider all of their options in development. And uh, thank you, and I just wanted to thank my colleagues who took the two pictures in my slides.